So, so I just noticed you've got this deficiency in knowledge and a deficiency in environment. Yeah, so that was different than Gilbert's deficiency of execution. So I always get, by people who know Gilbert, they always look at that and go, hey, you screwed that up. That's not, DE is deficiency of X. So I said, no, I changed all that. <laughs> the, newer, the newer versions of this have four types of deficiencies. At the bottom, there's a code there. But I have deficiency of the process itself. Yeah. A deficiency of the environmental supports. And then I take the deficiency of the human, I break it out. Because most of my efforts are for, for training purposes, I want to know if it's knowledge and skill or if it's something else. Because if, if, if the performer does not have the physical strength to do the job, we're not going to do training or we're going to have to put a gym in place and, and force everybody to train you know, physically. Um, so I, I had to make that distinction between that. And so what I was doing with the people that I was uh, assembling to document the performance I could start them thinking off from the very, near the very beginning that training is not going to solve some of these things. And therefore, when I went back to the, my client and said, training is not going to solve these things. And he says, you know, what the hell I'm, I'm hiring you to do training. I go, well, you know, you really want to get the performance to work, not just produce training. And then I'd have all the master performers that I worked with who would say, Hey, we can train on these things, these other things here, you know, we need to fix in the environment. So it's back to the, you know, process re-engineering, you know, total quality management kinds of stuff. Let's fix these enablers. And maybe we need to change the recruiting uh, uh, process and hire people in with more stamina and physical strength. Uh, and then we can train them. But there's certain things here that we're not going to be able to do. And there's other things that are totally in the control of management, as Deming would have said. You know, he said, it was like 86% to start with. And then later on, he changed it to 94. He said, 94% of the problems are due to the system. Yeah. Management's in control of the system. And so I embraced all of that and wanted to show, you know, so under the probable cause thing there, well, they don't know how and they don't take the time and not demanded by management. And I would show that to my client and, the, and my project steering team and say, the reason they're not doing it is because you don't demand it. There's no consequences. You're not even ex establishing the expectations. At least that's what your master performers say. And maybe the master performers are wrong. I don't know. Just because they said this, they conceded to this doesn't make them absolutely right. But this is, this is now your challenge because training is not going to fix that unless we go train management. And even if we train management, doesn't mean they're going to do it. What's the consequences for management for people not doing a territory plan? Because it was, was a big deal. They complained that our salespeople aren't doing territory plans. They just wander all over, you know, their multi-state area without a rhyme or reason. And they're wasting a lot of time and gas. And, you know, they could be making more sales calls if they were only more efficient about this. And they're calling on the wrong clients. They're calling on the wrong accounts. Somebody that's going to get you $50 a month versus $50,000 a month, you know, like, so, so that was the that was some of the drivers behind this particular project, which was from the mid '80s. Um, is that, you know, so they're so they need to do a territory plan, but they're not. Why? Because management's <laughs> demanding it. You know, so so it's not going to happen unless master performers have figured it out that I really need to do this. But the non-master performers did, thought it was busy work and not worth their while. But you know, the really top performers were thinking. They had figured this out. They had been doing this. Um, and management had asked for it. But and I think if I remember it correctly, management had a, 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 a guide or a, something that said, here's what a territory plan should look like. And these master performers said, we don't use that crap. That's crap. No, we're not, no, not going to do that. We're, I, I do it this way. And the next guy would say, I do it that way. And and so we ended up later on with training, taking the best of their approaches to developing a territory plan that then, you know, in the, on the left hand there, it's territory plan leads to account planning. Once you have a territory plan, you could do your account planning. Part right. of territory planning is figuring out, you know, who are the big uh, accounts? Who is going to buy the most from us? I'll call on them every week and other people I'll call on every month or quarter. 
you know, just to maintain some contact, but it's not worth my time to sit with somebody who's not going to give me very much business. Um, but anyway, so master performers had figured out all that out and were doing it, but most of the most the majority of the sales force was not. <laughs> So, so let me ask you a question. So, sure. um, how did you determine your interventions? So, you've already talked about knowledge and skills. Okay, we'll train them on the best practices. What about the other performance factors? How did how did you figure out what needed to be done? Did you just base it on your your gap and cause analysis? Well, for for the most part. So once we did so. The, some of the tricks behind this is that I did a detailed project plan and I met with the project steering team, the client, the requester, and all the other key stakeholders. So in this case, it would have been the regional vice presidents of sales. They had stakes in the game. If this was successful, they got a, more sales, they got a bigger bonus themselves personally. It'd be a big, huge win-win. And so I told them, I need your top people in a room for three days to do the analysis. And then I need a subset of them in the, in the room for three days to do design of the training. But so, and I'll meet with you and show you the analysis data so that you can confirm or deny it before we do anything with it in design. And that, and, and so I did an analysis report and I had a presentation, a formal presentation for the project steering team where I, took them through this performance data, especially the, okay, we're going to teach them how to do the outputs with the tasks, but here's what you need to pay attention to, client. Here's the typical gaps and here's the causes and look at those things here. Now, some of these things, these are in your control. If you're, if, if you're not demanding the territory plans, then they're not going to happen. By your non so we can train them, but still what's going to happen? No one's probably going to do them. Some people will, but not the majority of them. So you're going to have to start demanding to see them and providing consequences. You know, you could provide positive consequences. You can provide. So I would talk the steering team through these things here. And part of the conversation always then left the training project that I was on to what, how are they going to do this? And I said, well, you know, some of my clients, they, they would look at this data and they go, well, we need to assemble a critical action team, a term from the quality movement, and, and get them to tackle this and work in parallel. And so the question then became, should, I, should we stop the training effort until that's done or should we continue going on while this critical action team fixes some of the non-knowledge and skill issues? And... You know, that's a, that sometimes it, it, it's, you know, so if it was the process was bad and the process is really screwed up and, and nobody and the master performers don't use it at all. They don't follow the process because they said it, it would be stupid for me to do that. And I'm not stupid. And so you're going to have to re-engineer your process. Maybe then the training needs to stop or put on hold certain parts of the training until the process is redone. And then we can train people on the new process. So these are the things that I would share with the client. I said, you know, we can go into design and design a placeholder for training on the new process, but we won't be able to develop it after the design because it's going to take you longer to redesign that process than, you know, than our project. So, so it, depending on how quickly they can create a new process and prove it in trial it, pilot test it, whatever. And, and if we coordinate this, I can develop training on the new process, and then we go pilot test the new training. We'll be pilot testing the new process and the training, and then we can see how well it works. And so they would see, oh, so the different work streams will converge at that pilot test. I go, yeah. So, but we're going to have to be working in coordination, and that's going to take more time and effort than the original plan because we weren't, you know, uh, having to deal with all this uh, extraneous stuff. We were on a training uh, workflow, uh, work stream. And uh, so, so, the, so it became, so this helped. So I captured the data on flip charts that look just like these performance model charts. So that when my master performers that I sat in a room with me for three days and produced this and the other data, the knowledge and skill data, it would be exactly like they saw it on a flip chart only cleaned up. 
So I didn't rework it and do anything I wanted to capture, just like they were going to see it. So they could look at this and go, okay, yeah, this is familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, guy didn't screw this up when he documented it. And then, and then they could be part of the conversation with the project steering team about how are we going to fix these non-knowledge and skill issues? Training is going to fix the DKs. What about all these other deficiencies? What are we going to do? And sometimes the answer is, well, from a Pareto principle, you know, we don't have to fix every last one of these things. We need to fix the big things. We, we can let the other things just go. And so that became part of the conversation in the gate review meeting at the end of the analysis phase. I wanted my clients to approve the data that I was going to use and design. I wanted them to recognize what some of the other factors were in the current state performance. And then I also wanted to talk to them about transfer. We're going to go from analysis and design into development. We're going to pilot test the content. We're going to update it after the pilot test, and then we're going to release it. You're going to start deploying it or making it accessible, whatever. And how are we going to make sure that it transfers to the job? How are you, the regional vice presidents of sales, going to make sure that people start using what they were taught? If it's very different from how they've been working previously, they're probably not going to, they're going to revert back to what they've always done because that's human nature. So what are you project steering team members, the high, you know, muckety mucks in, the, in, in this realm here who have stakes, your stakeholders, how are you going to make sure that people adhere to the training? And they go, oh, those are good questions, guy. Uh, gee, what do you suggest? I go, well, you could start putting on your list of things to hold people accountable for that you want to see territory plans. Maybe you want to see territory plans every quarter. Maybe you want everybody to send you their territory plan and you're going to glance at them, one, to make sure that they get them, two, that they look reasonably well thought out and it's not just garbage compiled into a, a thing called a territory plan. So you can do certain things. You can hold or, and or you can hold your managers accountable between you and the salespeople that they do that for you and then they can report back to you. And if you find anybody lying and cheating about this here, you fire them. <laughs> then the word will spread and nobody's going to do that again. So you have to either make this a point of emphasis because it is critical to performance or it's just something that people should do but don't do, but it's in the bigger picture. It's not consequential. So you don't have to you know, uh, focus on every last thing. You need to pick what are the big levers here. And we all know that if you don't do a territory plan, you're going to waste time as a salesperson calling on the wrong accounts. You're going to wander from Illinois to Indiana, back to Illinois, back to Indiana, up to Wisconsin, back to Illinois, and back to Indiana, when you could have spent, you know, a week in Illinois and a week in Indiana and a week in Wisconsin. And, you know, but, you, but nobody's doing that. They're zipping all over the place without rhyme or reason. Um, and, you know, so so that that was the that was the major issue here. I learned a lot in that particular project about salespeople and territory planning, and account planning, because those things go hand in hand. If you have a territory and you're calling on somebody once a quarter, and all of a sudden they want to place a five million dollar uh, thing with you, you're going to have to change your territory plan and go call on them more often. Make sure everything's going okay. Take the sale, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. Call them, visit them, you know, do whatever you can to the care and feeding of your customers. And uh, so those two things interplay back and forth. And of course, the whole chain of things after that, you do customer call planning. Well, what are we going to talk about this time? What do I need to prepare? Then I make the call. Then I follow up. And I got, you know, reports and administration. You know, this was in the days before uh, we had. Uh, CRMs, customer relationship management software tools to populate and do all that stuff. And so it was paper back in the day when, when this uh, project was done. But so, so that, so, uh, so what, so what I always thought of this is I was always bringing my clients along on the journey of discovery of analysis, avoiding analysis paralysis you know, starting and getting the analysis done in a couple of weeks time and not taking months or whatever. And having this be the capture the voice of the master performers. And then I would share that with the clients, the stakeholders. And we could logically talk about what we are going to do from a training standpoint, but what are the other issues and how are they be resolved? Should they be resolved? How will they be resolved? 
And does that affect our training development project? Yes or no? And how? And specifically, and then replan if necessary. And they would be all on board with, okay, we're going to slow the training project down. We're not going to have it done by the end of the second quarter. We'll do it in the third quarter. But here's what we got to do in, in, you know, in addition to this. And then hopefully this will help us get, you know, meet our goals, which in this client's case was they wanted uh, more time spent in sales calls and less time on the road traveling. They wanted higher sales. They wanted uh, um, a higher hit rate of sales for a call. Um, you know, they had their all their sales metrics and, you know, we would see would we affect those when we were all done. But if we just put training in place, my goal was to help them see that if we just put new training in place, you're still out there in the current state or in the, in the new state, there's going to be these issues. And if they're not addressed, you're not going to achieve your goals because there's barriers out there. And you need to remove the barriers and re-engineer the process or the tooling or the data and information that you have. Because sometimes it's, you know, people are working on bad data or old data. And because that's what the system provides them with. And so what are you going to do about that? You basically use the same process, whether you're doing uh, training development or performance improvement. Yes, that was my goal when I created my, in, in 1982, when I, I became a consultant and I was put, I was the, the uh, we, we were a very small firm. I became the practice leader for instructional design, instructional systems design. And my two partners, they took on the, you know, performance improvement things. Uh, but I did the training stuff because that's where the revenues were for our small consulting firm. And when I started formulating this, because I started bringing on um, subcontractors to work with me, and I needed them to do things in a similar manner. We couldn't just, you know, we, we were going to be an engineering outfit and not an artist colony. We weren't going to be doing everything anyway. Anybody was, you know, <laughs> had to conform to the standards. In fact, in 94, I created a database that is very unforgiving. If you don't have the data for that field, that field shows up blank in the report like this, these reports on the right. Uh, if you don't get the typical performance gaps, that column is going to be blank. And then we can ask the question, why the heck didn't you get it? You know, so I, and I was even trying to get my two business partners to conform to a standard, you know, what the quality movement calls standard work. You know, this is what the output of standard work is. And when I was formulating all of my instructional systems design methods and the models and tools and techniques, I had in the back of my head that someday I was going to expand this into all of the variables for, for performance. And so the performance model is the heart of that. It captures, this is what current state looks like on the left and what the, and the gap analysis on the right. And then I can systematically derive the knowledge and skills required for training purposes, learning purposes, instructional purposes, but I can also systematically derive all the other spines on that fishbone. I can say, what are the data and information required? Chunk by chunk by chunk by, there are seven chunks there on the left. And so I would gather all of that data and I could say, you know, what's, what about the process itself? That's one of the things I learned from Rumler. Look at the process first. Is it, do we have one? <laughs> yes or no? If we do have one, are people adhering to it? Yes or no? If they're not adhering to it, why? You know, because it's stupid. Some people, the master performers might have said. So, okay, that's the issue with the process. And maybe that's the big issue. And if we fix that, everything is better. Or we can look at, and then he taught me never to look at the humans next. Look at the environmental enablers next. Look at culture and consequences. But you could systematically derive what's the culture and the consequence system need to be process by process. You know, what's it ideally? What do we have? What's the gap there? We don't have, we got the wrong consequences or we don't have the right tools and equipment. You know, um, who was it? Was it Covey who used the analogy of, you know, we don't, people don't have enough sharp saws. So <laughs> people working with dull saws and that's why they're performing. Yeah. Before. Sharpen the they saw. Don't have the right, yeah. And so there's all this stuff. So the, so the bottom part there, that's really a lot of Ishikawa diagram, the materials, the machines, yeah. the methods, 
the methods are embedded in the data and the information, if you will. The, you know, if I have standard operating procedures, SOPs to follow, that's in the data and information column. But I, if I don't have the materials to do the standard operating procedure or the tools and equipment or the facilities and ground, maybe I need a clean room. And we've got a leaky roof with dust blowing into the room. So that's no good. So we can figure out, you know, what's the environment got to provide. And then the humans step into that environment to work the process. Right. So that's how I typically explain that. So where I can look at, okay, so what do the people need to know? Not awareness, knowledge, and skills. Sometimes their prior knowledge is such that you make them aware of something and that's sufficient. Or you got to give them deeper knowledge or you actually need to give them a skill that leads to their task performance in the process box on the left. But there's physical attributes, you know, maybe they have to have stamina, good eyesight or good hearing. You know, if you're a sonar man in the, in the Navy, you got to have really excellent hearing, you know, and if you don't, you can't have that job. <laughs> That's just it. And, you know, psychological attributes uh, in the sales world. I remember have, I had a client who said, you know, there's on average, you make 27 sales calls before you make a sale. Well, that's difficult for some people. They can't take all that rejection. So we have huge turnover. And it's, it was because they weren't hiring in the first place, the people with their physical, psychological, intellectual attributes. Intellectually, I may need people to be, you know, concrete thinkers and do detailed tactical planning, or I need them to do strategic planning and do conceptual thinking. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, and maybe God didn't create enough people that are both concrete thinkers and conceptual thinkers, you know, switch hitters at the baseball, in a, in a baseball sense, they can't bat from the right or the left, they can only do one. And so we need to look, carefully understand, you know, what are these other attributes and values that people have when we select them, recruit them and select them for a job, and then we can train them on what we didn't get through the recruiting and selection system. And then we have the right human assets in place that will enable the performance. But if we don't, get, you know, if all three of these things aren't working adequately enough, they don't have to be all perfect, but they have to be worked well enough so that the outputs produced by the process are worthy outputs that are really worthy inputs downstream to the next customer. And if so, you, you have to start with that process. What is the process? What are the outputs? Okay, what do we got to do to produce that output in the process box? And what do the humans need to have and know? And what does the environment need to provide? And if those things aren't well enough, you know, if one thing is is poor, like this the dull saws, you know, what is it? Abraham Lincoln said, if I was given four hours to chop down a tree, I would spend three hours sharpening the axe, you know, and so. So we need to be, be cognizant of all the variables of process performance and have a way to look at that. And as processes change because the output changes and the standard operating procedures might change, we need to know that there's new materials and supplies. We need to know that people need to know how to do that differently. So what changes as, you know, as a change management tool when things change uh, driven by the process and the outputs what are the implications now to the enablers? What changes with them? Um, and then how do we make people aware of those changes or knowledgeable about those changes or skillful in those changes? That's, that's really it. And I think, you know, in the, in the human area, dealing with the human people, we too often don't do recruiting and selection in concert with training and development. Um, we let, you know, the, their recruiting based on criteria and, and they may not be authentic criteria for the job holder. And we should be trying to bring in people that, that minimize the training burden because the training burden is costly. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so my goal actually is to uh, create workshops to, to train people how to, how to do performance improvement. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, uh, I'll, I'll be getting back to you. <laughs> if, you're, if you're available, I'll have you help teach the workshops. Well, you know, I'd be happy to do Retired. that. I have, I have done, you know, webinars and workshops with clients on these kinds of things. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of this is, is not new. I re kind of recast things that I've yeah. learned, the total quality management movement and Rumler and Gilbert and, and other people along the way. 
Um, but you know, what, what you've got to create is something that's actionable. Yes. Actually <laughs> embrace and do and not take forever and a day to do it. So when no. I analysis, I try to do it in a three day meeting or less. When I do design of instruction, I try to do that in a three day meeting or less. And when I'm and most of my instructional efforts have been on training and development for the entire job. So it's not just chung. It's not just, you know, so I'm looking at the whole job most of the time, not all the time. Sometimes I zoom in on just, you know, something like territory planning and ignore the rest. And that takes a lot less time to do the analysis and design. And sometimes you can do the analysis and design in one meeting. The, what you give up when you do that, though, is checking in with the client to make sure they're okay with the analysis. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. that's a double-edged sword. I want them to approve it, but I also want them to be confronted with these are the deficiencies in the environment, <laughs> and you own that. <laughs> and you don't think you're going to train that away if you've got bad consequence system, you know, an imbalance in the consequence system. Training is not going to fix that. That consequence system is going to exist like it is. And if that's dysfunctional uh, to the process, then you, you know, you're inhibiting yourself. So I always looked at my chance to meet with my clients in a routine basis in what the quality movement generally calls the gate review meetings. I use that as an opportunity to share with the client what I've done, get them to either, you know, I tell them there's four decisions when we're done here. You can kill the project right now because this doesn't make any sense. Now, my immediate client always hated it when I said that, but I was giving them the opportunity to do that. And, felt <laughs> like that. and then I'd say, oh, or we need to defer what we're doing and wait for something else to happen to pick it up. Or you can, uh, modify what I've produced here because you don't like it and you want to change that, or you approve it, what we produce thus far, and fully resource and support us going to the next phase and doing something with this data. And I do that at the end of analysis. I do that with the end of design. When I get to the, when I do finish development, I really slide right into pilot testing because I've separated pilot testing from development activities because I wanted to make a big deal out of it. And I say, I tell the client, I'll meet with you, with you after the pilot test is done and I'll provide you with revision recommendations that if you approve will become revision specifications and that's how we'll update this content. Um, so I've kind of taken the traditional development phase, if you will, and pulled out the pilot test so that I can make a huge big deal about that. And at every one of those stages, when I meet with the client, I'm always talking about, well, transfer. How are we going to ensure transfer of this new knowledge and skills? Because, you know, most of the time training people train people on stuff and then they go back to the job and they do it the old way. Um, and so then that was a then it was a total wasted investment, a squandering of shareholder equity. And so how what are we what could stop this? You know, is it going to be the supervisors to say, hey, guy, I see what you're doing here. I don't I learned it the old way. I want you to do it the old way. So we're going to have to do something about those kinds of supervisors who don't know how to manage the new way of doing something. And they feel out of control. And so they force the learner to revert back to the old way. Well, that's you know, so so we have to <laughs> work on the supervisors and management about this is what we're training people. Why gotta be a, the advantage and now got to be accountability. Exactly. And so, the, and again, the <laughs> management's, and they would say, Guy, what do we do? And I go, Well, you put it on your checklist of things to ask in every meeting that you have with these people. We just trained your boy, Guy, on this thing here. Now, uh, is <laughs> it the new way or the old way? You know, so, and I'm holding you, the supervisor, the manager, responsible for Guy doing it the new way because that's why we invested in all of that. <laughs> So I've got to, and in fact, can, here's a piece of training for you, the new supervisor, on how to manage it the new way, which is something that's. Uh, I've had a couple of clients in the past, uh, Amico and Eli Lilly, who every time you produce training for them, there had to be a management supervisory package that oriented them to you know what they need to do before a guy goes off to training, what they need to do when guys in training if it's done locally, but if guys sent off to some, you know, training center to be trained, then that's different. And when he comes back, here's what you got to do to make sure that he has an opportunity to practice what he's learned, um, that you reinforce it, that you don't let him backslide to the old way because he's comfortable with that. And here's what's going to happen to you if you don't do that, you know, so they'd always <laughs> put little teeth into it about, you know, so your directors are watching the managers who are watching the supervisors who are watching the individual contributors 
contributors and seeing if they're actually doing the new process, uh, working in the new way, because that's what we invested, you know, that's what we intended when we re-engineered the process and we re-engineered the training. And we have to orient everybody to what does that mean to them in their jobs? And why would we force everybody to jump through all these hoops and do all of this stuff? Well, there's got to be some huge return on the end of these investments. Um, and that, you know, so, so you, when you take a systems view of this thing, you have to look at more than just the learners. You have to look at the learners' peers, the learners' supervisors, the supervisors' management. Otherwise, somebody is going to be what? the rock in the road and stop everything. Compre comprehensive system systematics systemic performance management so i've got to run to another meeting but i'll i'll send you a link uh so we can set up another uh, uh meeting and 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 discuss uh future possibilities well i'm happy to do that and if you'll send me a copy of this video i would appreciate it because i think i'd like to post some of this okay that'd or be great. you could post it well i'll let you post it. i may post it too but we started in the middle so we'll have to we'll have to look at it okay I'm I'll uh, I'll see you net uh, soon. All right, thank you Max. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye.